The study of dinosaurs is a tale of discoveries and blunders. For every breakthrough in understanding, there's usually a colossal error. The head that should have been a tail, the horn that was really a claw, the meat-eater's head stuck on the vegetarian's body. Today's scientists are like patient detectives on the trail of the tiniest clue, seeking the truth from fragments of bone, advancing new theories, and backtracking to correct old mistakes. Crystal Palace Park, a Jurassic Park of the Victorian age, opened in London in 1854. Here, for the first time, scientific ideas about dinosaurs were translated into full-size models molded from cast iron and cement. The audacious plan was masterminded by scientist Sir Richard Owen. The sculptures created the illusion that Owen and his contemporaries knew more about dinosaurs than they really did. At any rate, they knew more than the public did. The park was a triumphant success. It sparked a love affair between dinosaurs and the public, which has continued ever since. In this century, Hollywood has thrived on wild views of dinosaurs and romanticized the dinosaur hunter as a bold adventurer. The same image was deliberately cultivated by legendary fossil hunter Roy Chapman Andrews of the American Museum of Natural History. A self-confessed restless spirit, Andrews was notoriously impatient, often breaking valuable finds in his zeal to unearth them. At the American Museum, to destroy a specimen was to RCA it. RCA meaning Roy Chapman Andrews. Andrews would be party to a classic case of mistaken identity, one that would go uncorrected for 70 years. In April 1922, Andrews led an expedition deep into Central Asia's Gobi Desert. 125 camels, two trucks, three Dodge automobiles, fitted out with extra sturdy springs, servants, table linens, a pearl-handled Colt 45, and a Hollywood cameraman to publicize his exploits. Between brushes with heat, sandstorms, and bandits, Andrews stumbled across a sensational find. Dinosaur eggs in shallow nests dug into the desert soil. What dinosaur had laid the eggs? Everywhere, Andrews found bones of plant-eating protoceratops, a primitive hornless relative of triceratops. Andrews assumed that these were the parents. For the next seven decades, popular illustrations depicted protoceratops as a devoted parent guarding its nest. The expedition had also found fossils of a rare, strange predator, Resembling an ostrich without wings, the raptor was found on top of the nest. Andrews assumed it had died while feasting on the eggs. He named the beast Oviraptor, or Egg Thief. Then, in 1993, another team from the American Museum of Natural History returned to the Gobi. They found more nests full of eggs. Their most surprising discovery was an embryo still clinging to a fragment of egg shell. Roy Chapman Andrews had been mistaken. The eggs were laid not by the protoceratops, but by the oviraptor. Oviraptor was no egg thief, but a protective parent which had died guarding its nest. Flamboyant Andrews was easily tempted to make bold assumptions based on fragments of evidence. Yet every scientist faces similar pitfalls, according to paleontologist Robert Baca. 
Well, my mother, who's a creationist, sometimes rattles my cage by saying, well, Bob, you, you scientists, you always make things up. You get a single bone, you build a whole animal, you got the wrong head, the wrong tail, tail on the wrong end, head on the wrong end. That does happen on occasion. But almost always it's another scientist who, another anatomist, who catches the mistake and corrects it. And paleontology's been pretty good at catching those mistakes. Many errors are formed from hardened beliefs and incomplete discoveries, a point made emphatically by Harvard biologist Stephen J. Gould. Paleontology is a complex field. Most fossils are scrappy, you get little bits and pieces. And remember, the fossils of most creatures are representing animals that are dead and have been extinct for millions of years. Imagine you go out and you find a shell or a bit of a bone of a creature that has no modern analog on Earth today. It's very difficult. And so inevitably, large numbers of mistakes will be made in identification, and there's no disgrace in that. One of the first enthusiastic fossil hunters was American President Thomas Jefferson. An avid naturalist, Jefferson dispatched Lewis and Clark to report on any exotic beast or other rare animals they might encounter during their exploration of the Louisiana Territory. On another occasion, Jefferson was sent the fossil bones of an animal he could not easily identify. Never one to turn down a challenge, Jefferson labeled the fossil a giant lion's claw and missed the mark entirely. Among the many things that Thomas Jefferson did when he wasn't being president or sending out Lewis and Clark or purchasing Louisiana was paleontology. Je Jefferson actually wrote two technical articles in paleontology, and in one of them he made a notable error, but nothing to be ashamed of. It was a perfectly understandable mistake. He found a very large claw, and he thought it was a lion's claw. It doesn't look very much unlike the claw of a large carnivore. Now, it turns out it isn't. It's the claw of a giant sloth. But how would he have known that? Sloths today are little creatures that hang upside down from trees in South America. They're this big. How would Jefferson have known in the 1790s when he wrote this article that there were once sloths in North America that were 20 feet tall and that had big claws for digging? Bigger mistakes lay ahead. Fossils of the dinosaurs were finally coming to light. Until the 1800s, both the concept of extinction and the age of the Earth were unknown. When strange fossils were unearthed, they were often attributed to exotic beasts who might still be living in some remote corner of the globe. Elephant skulls, with large openings in the middle of its head for the trunk, were believed to be skulls of the one-eyed giant cyclops. The tusks of mammoths, dug up from quarries in Germany were identified as the horns of the fabled unicorn. According to one theory, the skull of the protoceratops with its bird-like beak and claws inspired the fable of the griffin. Then in Paris in the 1790s, the foundation for the concept of extinction began to be laid by a brilliant 26-year-old naturalist named Georges Cuvier. His methods of research are still used in paleontology today. Cuvier was studying massive bones dug up during renovations in Paris. Superficially, they resembled elephant bones. The idea that elephants once roamed Paris was thrilling for the Parisians, but Cuvier would stun them even more. By comparing these surprising bones with those of modern elephants, Cuvier concluded that they were remnants of extinct mammoths. His technique of comparative anatomy and his notion of extinction revolutionized the thinking of scholars and naturalists of the early scientific age. In 1795, a French general had shipped back to Paris a trophy of war, a pair of huge fossil jaws that had been found in chalk quarries in Holland. The jaws measured over three feet long. Cuvier examined them and concluded they belonged to a giant fish-eating lizard and named it Mosasaur. His identification was correct, but his conclusions would lead to centuries of misunderstanding. Cuvier decided the animal was distantly related to the monitor family of tropical lizards, which includes the Komodo dragon. His conclusion made a deep mark on the scholars of his age. Because it resembled nothing modern, it was presumed to be very old. 
soon old and lizard-like, became almost synonymous. In the history of paleontology, this would perhaps be the biggest mistake of all. In 1820, a young English doctor named Gideon Mantell found unusual teeth and vertebrae in a quarry near his home in Sussex. The shape of the teeth convinced him they belonged to a giant plant-eating reptile, yet he could find no record of such a creature in the living world. Mantell finally stumbled on a clue in a London museum where he was shown the teeth of a reptile inhabiting Central America, the iguana. He named his creature Iguanodon. The Crystal Palace Park opened in 1854 featuring replicas of the Iguanodon and other creatures. The sculptures piqued the public's curiosity and people flocked to the exhibit. It was the Jurassic Park of its time. The inaugural dinner of the park was a stylish affair held inside the belly of the half-completed sculpture of the Iguanodon. Presiding over the event was the eminent Sir Richard Owen, who had just coined the term dinosaur, meaning terrible lizard. Peter Doyle has traced the origins of Owen's ideas. In the 1850s, dinosaurs were a new concept. Dinosaurs had been really discovered in the 1820s, but not really thought of as a separate race of reptiles. They were thought just to be lizards. So in 1841, Sir Richard Owen came up with the term dinosauria. Owen recognized that his dinosauria were radically different from modern lizards. Their legs were more robust, suggesting faster moving creatures. Still, the sculptor of the Crystal Palace creatures, Benjamin Hawkins, would turn to existing animals for inspiration. The beasts in the park ended up resembling giant versions of lizards. The sculptures include many errors that modern paleontology has long since corrected. Megalosaurus, depicted as a low, squat, four-legged lizard, was really a swift, two-legged predator like T-Rex. Iguanodon looked even stranger. Hawkins gave it a horn on its snout, like a modern iguana. Later discoveries placed the horn in its rightful place as a defensive spike, projecting like a thumb from the creature's wrist. Today's reconstruction shows a very different iguanodon, finally free of the reptilian baggage. A biped, horizontal, with a stiff tail off the ground. The new iguanodon looks far more nimble, perhaps even a swift-footed, warm-blooded runner. In the 1920s, the great American nature artist Charles Knight began his long career. His vivid paintings were as influential in the 20th century as the Crystal Palace sculptures were in the 19th. Like his contemporaries, he depicted dinosaurs as slow, cold-blooded reptiles. Knight's lumbering mistakes were set into motion in the 1925 classic, The Lost World. Hollywood made even bigger mistakes all by itself. Plant-eating sauropods devastating a city and eating its people. Cavemen and dinosaurs living side by side, even though they were separated by 64 million years. Though Hollywood's mistakes are legendary, there was still plenty to go around among the paleontologists themselves. In the 1870s, when dinosaur fossils began turning up in the American West, museums back east began a race to acquire fossil collections. Suddenly, dinosaurs were more than curiosities. They were big business. No exhibit was sought more than the big brontosaurus. Brontosaurus belongs to the family of giant dinosaurs known as sauropods. Some weighed 20 tons and stood 15 feet at the shoulder. The hunt for the brontosaurus was to lead to a classic case of mistaken identity. In 1877, an aloof professor of paleontology at Yale University, Othniel Charles Marsh, received 10 boxes of bones dug up by a Colorado school teacher and part-time fossil hunter. By the time Marsh got around to looking at them, the teacher had sent a similar shipment to Edward Drinker Cope, a brilliant, hot-headed, self-trained scholar of independent means living in Philadelphia. Cope and Marsh each dispatched a team to Wyoming to find prized fossil sites. 
Sometimes the rivals dug so close to each other they spied on one another. Once the best specimens were taken, leftover fossils were smashed to bits by the team to deny their rivals any further finds. Edwin H. Colbert began his career in paleontology at the Museum of Natural History more than 60 years ago, not long after the bone wars between Marsh and Cope. Cope was studying a plesiosaur, which was one of the great aquatic reptiles, marine reptiles of Mesozoic times, and he got the skull on the wrong end. He put the skull on the end of the tail, and Marsh discovered that, and of course he didn't let Cope forget that. Well, of course, that was all a result of uh, a lot of hasty work. Both Marsh and Cope were men in a hurry. They were in a hurry to do as much describing as they could, you see. Humiliated, Cope at first refused to admit his mistake. Finally, in the dead of night, Cope crept into the great hall and with no one watching, he quietly made the correction. But Cope's rival bungled too. In the late 1870s, Marsh collected two magnificent skeletons of Brontosaurus, the first ever found. There was only one snag. Both specimens were amazingly well preserved, but the heads were missing. Marsh had to make an educated guess. Paleontologist Bob Bucker explains how the big dinosaur won its giant head. This is a really great head. It's the head of a Brontosaurian. Professor Marsh found the first good skeleton of a brontosaurian, brontosaurus itself, and it was a huge, powerful animal. But Professor Marsh didn't have a head. So he looked at other quarries for a head, and what sort of head should his brontosaurus have? Well, it had to be a great, big, strong head, and he picked this head. Wonderful head, uh, to orient you. That's the ears, and the eyes, the nostrils here. A great, big, boxy cranium. And this is the head Marsh put on Brontosaurus at Yale, and the New York Museum put the same sort of head on their Brontosaurus, and the museum in Pittsburgh put the same head on their Brontosaurus, and when the movie King Kong was made, the Brontosaurus that ate the sailor had this type of head, very fierce head with huge teeth. A great head, a wonderful head, a very adaptive head, but it's the wrong head. Marsh didn't realize there were actually two different types of Brontosaurians. One, like Amarasaurus, had tall shoulders, short tails, and big heads, while the other, like Diplodocus, or Apatosaurus, had long slender necks and tails and small heads. In his ignorance, he mounted a big skull from one group on the long slender skeleton of the other. The real shocker is that the correct head was found nearly 80 years ago. You see, the Carnegie Museum was digging a beautiful brontosaurus in the early part of the century. And they got the, the torso, and they got the base of the neck, and the front of the neck, and then the neck right behind the head, where the head should be, and a few feet away was this head. And the quarry man said, whoopee, we've got the head of brontosaurus. And the head preparator back at Pittsburgh said, whoopee, we have the head of Brontosaurus. But then the government paleontologist came in and said, wrong head. We all know Brontosaurus had a great big boxy head. This is an elegant, skinny, triangular head. It looks like Diplodocus, so it can't be the head of Brontosaurus. So this head, this wonderful head, the true Brontosaurus head, sat forgotten on a shelf in Pittsburgh until the mid-1970s when Professor McIntyre said, the quarry guy was right all along. This is the head of Brontosaurus. And it looks like a Diplodocus head because Brontosaurus and Diplodocus are sister species. They have the same construction all over from tail to head, so of course they're gonna have the same sort of cranium. In the 1970s, views of Brontosaurus changed. They had once been seen as sluggish swamp dwellers. New discoveries showed that Brontosaurus lived in dry grasslands. Barker compared their mighty legs with the muscular limbs of fast-moving elephants and rhinos. Like elephants in Africa today, Brontosaurus may have migrated hundreds of miles in search of food. Nothing could be more different from the old image of a sluggish reptile. What other mistaken ideas about the dinosaurs remain to be corrected?
Today, there are more fossil hunters searching for the bones of dinosaurs than ever before. Few are trained paleontologists. Many dig out of sheer fascination with the hope of finding something that died out nearly 65 million years ago. Robert Bakker is a firm believer in training larger numbers of amateur paleontologists and has a theory of how to prevent the narrow thinking that can lead to mistakes. The most important thing to look for when you're out digging dinosaurs is the stuff over there in the periphery of your vision. When we go out to dig, Maybe we're looking for a giant megalosaur meat eater, but what may be more important is the thing over here, the thing over there, the peripheral context. So when you're digging dinosaurs, you've got to have a sort of a 360 degree ecological vision. Look at everything, be aware of everything. Undoubtedly, the paleontologists of tomorrow will enjoy a few laughs at our expense. In the search for dinosaurs, more mistakes will be made but they are an inevitable misstep in a field where so much is still unknown. <laughs>